Welcome back, everyone. I'm almost done with the introduction, not quite. So I gave you a, a little timeline on the important things uh, uh, which we want to discuss during this course. And what I want to do at the end of the introduction is to say a few words about the observational situation. So uh, what we will discuss here and what I talked about last time was mainly theory, mathematical structures, solutions to Einstein's field equation and so on. The question is, do these things which are described by these solutions, that's black holes, rotating, non-rotating, charged, non-charged, do they exist in nature? And actually we are fairly convinced by now that they do exist. We distinguish four classes of black holes. So let me write observational situation. We distinguish four classes of black holes and we um, classify them by their mass. So there are the so-called supermassive black holes. So this is something like um, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. Yeah, the symbol, the, the ring with a, with a dot in the middle, that's a symbol for the sun. So this means a solar mass. And these so-called supermassive black holes have a million or maybe even a few billion solar masses. And we are fairly convinced that they exist in the centers of galaxies, in particular in the center of our own galaxy. So in the center of own, our own galaxy, we have a radio source, which is denoted Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius, that's a constellation, Schütze in German. So that's uh, the direction towards the center of our, of our galaxy. And uh, there is this radio source, and uh, well, the radio source is of course not a black hole. You cannot see a black hole, right? A black hole will certainly not emit radio radiation, but uh, a black hole attracts matter. So in particular, we assume that a black hole is associated with an accretion disk or an accretion torus or something like that. And the matter in this, in this disk will rotate, and when it comes towards us, then it will be Doppler enhanced, and then we see uh, we see it on this side, we see it uh, brighter than on the other side. And the idea is what we see, this radio source, that this is matter coming towards us when it circles around the, the black hole. So this is observable in the radio, with radio telescopes. In the optical we don't see anything uh, near the center of our galaxy, because there is uh, there's so much dust that we cannot look through the dust. Yeah, so with optical telescopes, we cannot find out anything about the center of our galaxy. It works in the radio, it works in the infrared. In the infrared, we see stars circling around this, uh, this object, this compact object in the center of our galaxy. And uh, actually, there's uh, one star which has made already a full revolution since it was detected in the 1990s. So we know its uh, orbital elements fairly accurately. And from that, by, uh, by elementary celestial mechanics, we can calculate the mass of the thing in the center. And the mass is something like four million solar masses yeah, in the, for the object in the center of our galaxy. And uh, well, on the other hand, this mass must be concentrated in a fairly small volume. We can also estimate this volume from other observations. And all the indications point towards a black hole. We're not complete, we cannot completely rule out all other possibilities, but I think it's fair to say that all alternatives which are still possible are much more exotic than a black hole. So for instance, a boson star would be an alternative. Yes, it's a very, very exotic star consisting of very exotic matter, uh, which is purely hypothetical. There's no indication from observations that such a thing might exist. But that would be a model which would still be in a, uh, compatible with all the observations. And uh, even more complicated things, neutrino balls or things like that. But not ordinary stars, this doesn't work. So we are fairly convinced that this is a black hole. And uh, then there are many other galaxies. A famous one is M87, uh, a, a galaxy which has a, has a huge jet in the radio, radio observation. So it's one of the, one of the famous um, uh, galaxies with a jet. And also there is very good evidence that in the center there is a black hole. There's even speculation that there are two black holes. There are two which are, so there are two galaxies have merged. 
and their central black holes are now encircling, uh, circling around each other. So that's a possibility. It's not, uh, we're not sure that this is true, but uh, some people speculate that it might be even two black holes. And here the mass estimate is something like several billion solar masses. Yeah, so it's much farther away from us, of course, than uh, the center of our galaxy. But on the other hand, the, the mass is much higher. So for this reason, the observational, uh, yeah, the possibilities to, to see something, to observe something, are not much worse than they are for Sagittarius A star. And uh, I will certainly discuss later in this course these objects uh, at quite some details. And there are other ones. Uh, many people even assume that uh, there is a black hole in more or less any galaxy. Yeah, that's a very likely, very likely possibility. So these are the supermassive black holes, order of million or uh, billion solar masses. And I leave a gap here, and then there are the stellar black holes. Stellar black holes. So they have, uh, yeah, a few solar masses. Yeah. So this is something like, uh, let's say, ten. 10 to maybe 15 solar masses, something like that. So they are, these are, um, uh, these are the masses of, of very massive stars. Yeah. So um, there's a most, uh, the best known candidate, which I mentioned already last time, is Cygnus X1. It's a radio source in our own galaxy. Fairly close to us. Uh, I'm not quite sure how far, but only a few light years, uh, something like I think 10 light years or something like that. So it's fairly close. And uh, what we see is a ray, is an X-ray source. So we see X-ray, X-rays. Again, if it is a black hole, we cannot look inside the black hole. We will never be able to look inside a black hole. We only see the matter moving around the black hole or falling into the black hole. And here is the idea that this is a binary. So there are two stars. The one which uh, is a black hole candidate, and there's a companion, and there's a mass flow from the companion towards this, this black hole. And what we see is this uh, is rapidly moving matter. And when, when gases are in, in rapid motion, when they are very hot, then they emit X-rays. And that's what we, what we observe. So this is a very good candidate since many years, and uh, there are also a few others. So these are things in, within our own galaxy. And uh, so these are the two classes of black holes where we are fairly sure that they do exist. And then they are more speculative. Here are the so-called intermediate black holes. So this would be something like, uh, say, uh, yeah, ten hundreds or thousands of solar masses yeah, in between these two classes. And they are speculative. So we have no really good evidence that they exist. Uh, so, but some people speculate that they be, that they are maybe in globular clusters. Yeah. Our galaxy is uh, surrounded by a halo of globular clusters. Uh, any hobby astronomers here in the room? No, for instance, there's a famous globular cluster M13 in Hercules. So it, if, you, if you look at it with a small telescope, you just see a foggy spot, more or less circular. And if you uh, have a better telescope, which can resolve it, then you see that there are many, many stars circular in a, in a circular field arranged. So they are to be distinguished from the so-called open globular clusters, which are irregular. Yeah? The Pleiades are a famous example for an open star cluster. It's not circular. Yeah? These are the globular clusters, which are in the halo of our galaxy, mainly. And some people speculate that at the center of these globular clusters, there might be also black holes. And if this is true, then they would be in this range. And then there are the <laughs> even more speculative mini black holes. So this is, let's say, much less than one solar mass. And uh, yeah, there are speculation that they, as again, that they are speculative. We do not know if they exist, but they might have come into existence very shortly after the Big Bang. And things which come into existence very shortly after the Big Bang, Big Bang they are called primordial. Yeah, so from very early times of the universe. 
So that's uh, and uh, well, there are also there are also speculations that they might be produced in accelerators like the LHC. Actually, if they are produced in accelerators already now or in the near future, then they will certainly also be produced in our atmosphere. <coughs> Because if the cosmic rays rush towards our atmosphere, then the energies are comparable. They're even higher than the energies which the LHC um, uh, can, uh, can reach. And if they ever will be produced in the LHC, which is not completely, uh, cannot be completely ruled out, it's very unlikely with the energies uh, they are operating with now, but it cannot be completely ruled out that. Yeah, sometimes in the future maybe they can be produced in accelerators, then they will certainly also be produced in the atmosphere. And uh, well, obviously, if they are produced in the atmosphere, they are harmless, yeah? because they have never done us any harm. And uh, we have also a very good explanation for that, because if they are produced, then they will, be, then they will radiate, uh, radiate away uh, themselves <laughs> very quickly by way of Hawking radiation. Yeah? So uh, they, they won't do much harm if they exist. So these are the four classes of black holes. And when we, when we discuss our mathematical models, and after that, uh, the astrophysical relevance, the possibility that they are actually be observed, then we will concentrate on these two classes. And I will speak about that later in the course for some detail. Incidentally, I can already mention now that next term, we will have again a course on black holes here in this, um, uh, in this um, uh, university, uh, but this time it will be from an observer. So I will look at black holes from a theoretical point of view. Next term, we will have Silke Britzen here, who is a radio astronomer from Bonn, and she will give a course on black holes from an observer's point of view. And she can certainly tell you much more about these things than I can do. So this is one of her favorite uh, galaxies. She has done a lot of observations with this, with the jets and in, in, uh, in, in galaxies and things like that. So uh, I think this will complement what, what I'm talking here quite nicely. And we are quite happy that she, she agreed to, to come and give a course here. OK, this was the introduction. Now we are ready to start with the formalism. And to begin with, as I said, I will give a brief, uh, yeah, uh, how do I say, um, uh, yeah, a brief review, let me put it this way, of the formalism of general relativity. It will not be much more than just fixing my notation. So I have to assume that uh, you have a basic familiarity with the formalism, otherwise I couldn't talk about black holes uh, during this course. So uh, my conventions are the following. When we are doing general relativity, we are playing around with four-dimensional manifolds. So we have coordinate systems um, where the coordinates run from one to four. And my convention is that I use Greek indices for, uh, well, actually, I don't label them 1 to 4, I label them 0 to 3 convention, and I will use Einstein's summation convention, uh, yeah, um, Einstein's uh, summation, yeah, convention. Summation rule, oops, for Greek indices. which take values, so I'll, let's say mu, nu, or something like that. They take values 1 to 3. And Einstein's summation rule means if an index appears twice, one as a lower index, one as an upper index, then summation is understood over this index. Indices and for Latin indices, which will occur not too often, but occasionally. Oh, then I will write i or j and they take values 1 to 3. And then I can say what a, what a general relativistic space-time is. Hope everybody knows this. So in my notation, it's a pair. 
m comma g, where m is the four-dimensional manifold. Yeah, and just to be on the safe side for some technicalities, when I say manifold, I always mean nice manifold. This means the infinity manifold, and it means that these topological uh, axioms are satisfied. There's yeah, the host of axiom and the second countability axiom, so that I can do integration on the manifold in a nice way. So, very roughly speaking, just to, to remind you, a manifold is something which can be coordinatized, and if you say it is four-dimensional, then it means that we need four coordinates in order to, to label the points in an open neighborhood. And the characteristic of manifolds is that in general we cannot find a global coordinate system. So we have to do coordinate patches on the manifold. So this is, this is M, and G is a Lorentzian metric. What does that mean? means it's the second rank tensor field. So in my notation I would write this in this basis. So if I have coordinates x0, x1, x2, x3, then I can consider the differential, which are covector fields on the manifold. I take tensor products, then I get a tensor field of second rank. So I get a basis for all tensor fields of second rank, and here are coefficients g mu nu, which have to satisfy a couple of conditions, which I write down now. So what is written here is an arbitrary tensor field of second rank. Yeah? First rank, first rank, tensor product of the two things give second rank. So, uh, and what are the conditions? So the g mu nu's, you can uh, visualize them as written in terms of a matrix. Yeah? So this is g naught naught, g naught one, g naught two, g naught three, and so on. So it's a four by four matrix. Of course, the functions depend on x. So the whole thing lives on a manifold. So the coefficients will depend on the point of the manifold, which we label with the coordinates. And this matrix g mu nu must have a couple of uh, properties. First, it must be symmetric. Yeah, the tensor product is in general not symmetric. Let me just remind you. So this is a non-trivial condition. And the second, if it is symmetric, then I can diagonalize it at one point. Yeah, a symmetric matrix can always be diagonalized at one point. It depends on x, and it will not be possible to diagonalize it everywhere simultaneously. But at one point, it can be diagonalized. And the second property says that in the diagonal, there are uh, uh, there must be a certain sequence of plus and minus signs. That's what we call the signature. And the signature we work with is a Lorentz signature, which gives us space-time geometry. So uh, let me write this in this way. So I can do this only at one point for, we are writing English, <laughs> for every, every point P and M. There our coordinates, I have to break the line unfortunately here, there are coordinates such that my metric at this point P, only at this point P, is diagonal with the diagonal elements minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. So if I expand this in the basis, I get minus dx naught squared plus dx1 squared, plus dx2 squared, plus dx3 squared. So if I can do this in a whole neighborhood, not just on one point, but in a whole neighborhood, or maybe on the whole manifold, manifold then I'm doing special relativity. Yeah? Then I have the metric of special relativity, which is called the Minkowski metric. But in general relativity, we have this situation only, yeah, <coughs> at one point. So uh, the picture, the visualization is that we should think of our manifold M as something being curved. It's four-dimensional. Please try to imagine that this is a four-dimensional thing. And at each point we have the tangent space. So here's a point P, and we can consider the tangent space. 
So this is then usually denoted TPM. And on the tangent space, we have this geometry. So we have the light cone here and everything else, which you know from special relativity. But you have this for each point. And at other points, the light cone will be, uh, yeah, will be situated in a different way so that all these light cones do not fit together as they do in special relativity. Yeah? So, they are, uh, so we are living now in a space time which has the properties of special relativity only in very small neighborhoods. In small neighborhoods, we can always use special relativity as a good approximation. And the statement that this is true, that's one version of the equivalence principle. Yeah, that in small space-time regions, small space-time regions, yeah, not only spatial, uh, it must not only be spatially small, but also uh, uh, we are allowed to look at it only for a short time. Yeah, it must be small in space and time. And uh, then we have, the, we have a good approximation, the situation of special relativity. So you may realize this tangent space here by Einstein's elevator. Yeah? So inside the elevator, we have the, um, we are, uh, which is falling, uh, freely falling in a gravitational field, we have the situation of special relativity. So that's uh, the idea behind this, this picture, this geometric picture. Okay, so that's the definition. And uh, there are, of course, many, many Lorentz and manifolds. Most of them are just mathematical objects, but some of them are thought to be reasonable models of parts of our world. And in particular, we will discuss some particular Lorentz manifolds, Lorentz and manifolds, which are, as we think, good models for uh, describing the space-time around one of these black holes. Okay, so uh, we have the metric. So if we specify a gravitational field, yeah, a space-time with curvature which describes the gravitational field, we give the metric. So we have to give this, uh, this metric, um, this matrix of met uh, metric coefficients. And um, yeah, uh, for, each, for each geometry, there's a, particular, uh, there's a particular metric. And we will discuss a couple of them later. So a general feature is that because this thing is non-degenerate, so you see, the, it's a diagonal matrix with elements minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. So that's a matrix which is uh, invertible. Yeah? Minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one on the diagonal. Zeros everywhere else is an invertible matrix. And um, this means that we can introduce the inverse matrix. matrix and this is usually denoted with upper indices in coordinates. And this is defined yeah, just to be the inverse matrix. So we have g mu nu, g nu tau must be the Kronecker. Yeah. So this is matrix multiplication, summation over neighboring indices. So if you write this matrix and this matrix multiply it out, you get the unit matrix. This means one is the inverse of the other one. And this uh, always exists for a Lorentzian metric, or more generally for a um, for any non-degenerate uh, symmetric tensor field. Okay, if we have the metric, then we can do physics in this space-time, in this particular space-time. Ah, first of all, we should, uh, I should uh, mention a mathematical uh, convention. Now we have the G mu nu with indices down and the ones with indices up, and we can use this for raising and lowering indices. That's one, that's a thing which we will do uh, frequently in the following. So we define, or let's say we raise and lower. Indices with, well, for raising indices, we need the one with the upper indices. And for lowering them, we need the one with the lower indices. And how, and how does this work? If we have, say, a vector field, u mu, yeah, that's uh, a tensor field with just one upper index, then we can lower this index by multiplying it with a metric. And that would be denoted by u with a lower index. Here's summation over mu. Or if we have a covector field, yeah, that's something with one lower index, and it could raise this index. 
and write it in this way. So the summation convention in combination with this rule of lowering and raising indices is really an ingenious idea. It makes equations much, much shorter than they would be if you would write everything out. And uh, both things were introduced by Einstein. That's why it's called Einstein's summation convention. And he also introduced this rule of ra raising and lowering indices. And he occasionally used to say, uh, yeah, in a jocular manner that his only contribution to mathematics was that he, that he found out that formulas become much shorter if one introduces this uh, summation convention. Um, okay, so this was uh, a mathematical convention and then we can discuss a little bit uh, yeah, the physical things which we can discuss if we have a Lorentzian manifold. So if you have a Lorentzian manifold, we have one particular space-time model and now we want to do physics in this space-time model. And one way of doing this, the most important way, is by throwing particles or light into it and look how particles and light is moving. So for that we first has to have to distinguish between objects moving at the speed of light and objects moving at a lower speed. And I think I do this on the other board. Oops. So the metric determines. So if I have a metric, if I had a have a particular space-time geometry then a lot of things are determined by the metric. The first thing is what we call the causal structure. Yeah, that's the distinction between uh, objects which are moving at the speed of light and uh, at a lower speed. So we can do this in the following way. If we have a curve in space-time, what would that be? A curve has a curve parameter, let's call it S. And uh, it maps, the curve maps this parameter onto a point in the manifold. So if we think in coordinates, then we would write this as x of s. So this is a shorthand for the four coordinates as functions of s. Yeah, that's what we would call a curve in the manifold. Uh, we say that uh, it is yeah, um, time-like, light-like, or space-like if the following holds. Well, we look at this expression. The metric is a function of space-time points, so I can evaluate it along the curve. Yeah? Now, if S is running over a certain interval, then this runs uh, along a curve in the manifold, and I evaluate my metric coefficients along this curve. And I can multiply this with the derivatives. Derivative means derivative with respect, uh, the dot means derivative with respect to S. And this thing can be positive, negative, or zero. And that's exactly this distinction. If this, um, yeah, well, we have the convention with uh, one minus sign and three plus signs. So the time-like ones have uh, negative, have this expression negative. The light-like ones have it equal to zero, and the space-like ones have it, uh, sorry, bigger than zero. And well. I hope everybody knows this expression. Well, if you go at, if you evaluate this as a particular point where we have uh, brought our metric in the standard form, then we have just a situation of special relativity. So then, uh, I hope everybody uh, recognizes this expression as. Uh, determining whether the tangent vector is on the light cone, inside the light cone, or outside the light cone. So the picture is like that. This is now in TPM, in the tangent space. At all, I should write Tx of S m. And here I have a light cone. And uh, yeah, here, inside the light cone, here are the time-like ones. 
here outside are the space-like vectors. Oops. And on the light cone are the light-like ones. Yeah. So if I have a curve which is time-like, this would mean the tangent vector is inside this light cone. That would be a time-like curve. And for a light-like curve we would have it on the boundary and for a space-like curve we have it outside the light cone. And the interpretation of course is that uh, the time-like ones are objects which move at a speed smaller than the speed of light the light-like ones move at the speed of light and the space-like ones they are, cannot be associated with signals. These are objects, mathematical objects, which move at a speed bigger than the speed of light. Okay, so that's the first thing which is uh, given to us by the, uh, by the metric. If we have a time-like curve, we usually um, uh, this means this must be negative then we usually normalize it in a certain way. Let me explain this for a, for a velocity field of a fluid. That's something which we will discuss uh, soon. Uh, let me write it this way. Uh, material medium, material, or let's say material continuum. So you might say that's another word for a fluid something which fills the space-time continuously is described by a vector field which I denote capital U. So this is a vector field, so it's something which can be expanded in this Gaussian basis of the coordinates by a vector field U. And of course, the medium should not move uh, at a speed bigger than the speed of light. Actually, if it is a material medium, it should move at a speed smaller, strictly smaller than the speed of light. So it should satisfy the condition g mu nu, u mu, u nu, smaller than zero. And uh, well, the number, the negative number, which is uh, here on this right hand side, this uh, just determines the parameterization, right? If we reparameterize the integral curves, then we multiply the velocity vector field with a scalar factor, and then we get the scalar factor here in this expression. And we can normalize this. So the picture is this here. We have our continuum. At each point, we have this velocity vector here. Let me write it this way. U. And uh, yeah, this is time-like, so it lies inside the, the light cone. Here is the light cone. Oops. And uh, yeah, if we reparameterize the curve, then we stretch or, uh, or uh, yeah, push together this, <laughs> this, this vector u. And we fix the parameterization. Oops. by requiring well well this is a velocity so the whole thing has the dimension velocity squared and it should be negative what would be the natural idea of normalizing this of course we put it equal to minus c squared where c is the speed of light so that's a normalization condition and then, as hopefully everybody knows, then the parameter is called proper time. That's the usual convention in GR and also in special relativity that we use a parameterization by proper time. And in special relativity, you derive formulas, how this, uh, how this changes if you go from one observer to another one. And you have this famous um, uh, um, uh, time dilation formula and things like that. Okay, so the causal structure is the first thing which is fixed by the metric. 
So these time-like curves are any objects which move at the speed of light. So they can move just uh, freely falling without external forces or they can move under any kind of external forces which are allowed in the sense that they don't accelerate the thing uh, to velocities bigger than the velocity of light. And obviously the freely falling particles are distinguished among all the time-like curves and that's the second thing which is determined by the metric that's the geodesics. The best way of writing the geodesic equation is by using the Lagrange formalism. So we consider the hope everybody knows the Lagrange formalism from a course on mechanics. The Euler-Lagrange equation, what was this? If you have a Lagrange function, then you write down the Euler-Lagrange equation. L is the Lagrangian, it depends on x and x dot. That's the usual uh, way of writing it in classical mechanics x mu dot minus dl by dx mu is zero. That's the Euler-Lagrange equation. And we do this for a particular Lagrangian. It is built with a metric. So we want to get something which comes from the metric. And we do this in the following way. There's a factor one half, which is a pure convention. Some people omit it, by the way. But uh, the majority of people put the one half here. And then I have the g mu nu, which depends on x. And we have the x mu dots and x mu dot. So what is on the right hand side is a function of x and x dot. So that's a possible choice for a Lagrangian. And we can evaluate this equation and see what we get. And what we get is what is called the geodesic equation. So this Euler-Lagrange equation yeah? if we just calculate it, if we insert for L this expression calculate the partial derivatives so here this, this derivative gives something with x dot and then we have another derivative d by ds means the same as a dot. Yeah, dot means derivative with respect to s. So we get an x double dot. So we get a second order differential equation. And what we get if we juggle the terms a little bit around is a geodesic equation. Where the gammas are the famous Christoffel symbols and they depend on x. We write this here. and gamma mu sigma tau, they are defined in the following way. G mu, let's say rho, and then come the three partial derivatives of the metric. Oops. So here's the summation index. It's here, it's here, it's here. And the speaking indices are sigma and tau, sigma tau, sigma tau, sigma tau. So if I know the metric, I can calculate the gammas. And if I have the gammas, then I get this equation. This is the Euler-Lagrange equation which comes from this Lagrangian. And that's what we call the geodesic equation. So it's an ordinary differential equation on the manifolds for curves. That's one of my favorite <laughs> exam questions that I ask people is this a partial differential equation or an ordinary differential equation. And it's really incredible how many people say it's a partial differential equation because I just see the partial derivatives in the gammas. Yeah? But that's not how this equation should be read. The gammas are not the unknowns. The gammas are assumed to be given here. The unknowns are the coordinates of the curve. And the dot is a total derivative, yeah? it's, uh, so it's clearly a, an ordinary differential equation. It's an equation for a curve. So if you give initial conditions, x of 0, x dot of 0, then you get a unique solution, a unique curve. 
And this is what we call the geodesic uh, corresponding to this initial condition. Let me see what is the sentence. This Euler equation reads, there's a, the verb missing, uh, and it's called the geodesic equation. So in flat space, yeah, if we do special relativity, if we do special relativity, this means the metric has this form not only at one point, it has this form everywhere. Then clearly the gammas are zero, yeah, because the g's are constant. Yeah, they are just what is usually called eta rho sigma, yeah, the coefficients of the Minkowski metric. So then the gammas are zero, and the equation just says x double dot is zero, which is obviously the equation for a straight line. Yeah? So in flat space, the geodesics are the straight lines. And, well, if you look at this term more closely, if you discuss its geometric meaning, you will find out that, in a sense, these curves are the straightest curves you can have on a curved manifold. They are not straight. There are no straight lines on a curved manifold, but they are as straight as a curve could be. So what it means is that they are straight not only in first order, every curve is straight in first order, the tension is always straight, but they are straight even in second order. Yeah, even the second order doesn't give a deviation from a straight line, it only comes in the third order. So they are as straight as a curve can be. And for this reason they are the natural generalizations of the, yeah, of the inertial motions in special relativity. And on a curved manifold with a gravitational field, you would call this freely falling particles. Yeah? So the geodesics are freely falling particles. So they are just following the geometry which uh, encodes the gravitational field. I think I have to clean the board. Oh, we have even the luxury of water in this room. Very good. So we can now, just, ah, there's, there's one point I forgot to mention. Um, we distinguish curves according to being time-like, light-like, and space-like. And now we have the geodesics. It would be very bad if the property of being space-like, time-like, or light-like would change from point to point. So if a curve would start as a time-like geodesic and later it would become space-like or light-like, that would be very bad. But fortunately it doesn't happen. Mathematics is... Um, is kind enough to us so that it always guarantees that the causal character of a geodesic doesn't change. We will do this uh, as an exercise in the first worksheet. So we will demonstrate that actually if a geodesic starts with a time-like tangent vector then it will be time-like everywhere. And the same uh, for space-like and light-like. Oops. So we can distinguish in a unambiguous way light-like geodesics from time-like ones and space-like ones. And of course we interpret the light-like ones as light rays or classical photons if you prefer to think in terms of particles. And we associate the time-like geodesics with freely falling massive particles. So that's the most important um, interpretational idea associated with the space-time. Yeah? So if you want to discuss the physics going on in the space-time, then we need to know how freely falling particles and light rays are moving. And this is given to us by the geodesic equation. So let me see. I hope I can write on this in a minute. Yeah, that's the geodesic equation, and now comes the interpretation. So the time-like geodesics are freely falling particles.
So that would be planets, for instance. Yeah? If you have a space-time model which describes the neighborhood of a star, of our sun, for instance, then you'll just watch the motion of planets or asteroids or comets and things like that. And you can treat them with, within a very good approximation as uh, freely falling particles and the light-like ones as light rays or freely falling photons if you want to put it this way. And uh, well, light rays, of course, is understood uh, also as free light rays. Yeah. So if you put mirrors or lenses uh, into the way of the light, then of course it would not move on geodesics. Yeah. So it's freely propagating light. So yeah, that's an important point for the interpretation. And when we discuss particular space times, so as I said, we will discuss the Kerr metric, for instance, in great detail. Then. Uh, I think uh, about 70% of the time of the discussion of the Kerr metric will be about the geodesics in this space-time because this gives the interpretation. Okay, uh, yeah, with the Christoffel symbols which occur in the, uh, in the geodesic equation, we can uh, build uh, covariant derivatives. That's an important mathematical tool. The Christoffel symbols Oops, symbols define a covariant derivative. What is that? Well, if you have a, say, a vector field, let's say a vector field u mu, and you, uh, this depends on x, the components depend on x, and of course we can form the partial difference as a partial derivative. This object is not a tensor field. Yeah, if you calculate how it changes under a change of coordinates, you see it that it transforms inhomogeneously. It does not have the tensorial transformation behavior. So the partial derivative, our good old partial derivative, does not take tensor fields into tensor fields. But if we have an object with a certain transformation behavior, such as the Christoffel symbols, then we can make out of this something which does transform like a tensor field. And in this case, we need nu, nu, tau, nu, tau. Yeah, we add the Christoffel symbol, summation over, over tau, and we call this a covariant derivative, usually denoted with a del of u mu. And this is a tensor field. Yeah, if you have it in one coordinate system, then in another coordinate system, you get it just by multiplying with, uh, with the Jacobi matrix. Whereas this here transform, transforms inhomogeneously. And this also transforms in, inhomogeneously just in a way that the two inhomogeneities cancel each other out. So for the contravariant, uh, uh, for a contravariant index, what I've given here as an example, we have the plus sign. If you play the same game with a covariant index, say you have a, a covector field A rho, then you do the analogous thing with a minus sign, and you again have a, have a tensor field here on the left-hand side. Now I have to be careful with the indices. Now I need a summation index, I think. U rho A tau, yes, that's it. U rho, U rho, U rho. You always must have uh, the same speaking indices on both sides, right? And all the other indices must be summed away. An index which occurs on the right-hand side but not on the left-hand side must be summed away. And here it is. And here also it is, the tau. Okay, and uh, you can do this also for tensor fields of higher rank. You get for each index which your tensor field carries, you get one gamma term. And you get it with a minus sign for the covariant indices and with a plus sign for the contravariant indices. Okay, so we can now uh, do covariant uh, differentiation. And uh, yeah, maybe I should mention that in this notation, the geodesic equation can then be written in a different way. Then I will use this notation maybe occasionally. Then the geodesic equation reads um, for 
that's, that's a capital X. Uh, maybe it's a little bit difficult to distinguish. That's a capital X. And this is the derivative of my curve, little mu. And so that would be the geodesic equation in this notation, where this is a vector field, so it has components with an index mu. And what this is in co correspondence to this notation is just x mu, no, sorry, x tau del tau x mu. Yeah. So this is something which gives the components of a vector field, and I say that's a vector field del xx. Yeah. Del xx, well, if you start from the coordinate expression, you can say del xx is introduced in this way. If you introduce the del operator invariantly, then you do it the other way around. Actually, when I give a GR course, I start with this as an invariant object, and then I derive these equations. But you can also do it the other way around. The old ones, Einstein and so, they always started with this formula. formula so. For them, a tensor field was something which has a certain number of indices and transforms in a certain way. Yeah? That was a tensor field for, the, for Einstein's generation. Now for us, it's a, it's a section in a tensor bundle or uh, whatever fancy terminology you prefer. But of course, it's the same, it's just terminology. So, okay, I said uh, the metric determines the causal structure, then the metric determines the geodesics, and what else does the metric determine? Of course, the curvature. And, uh, well, the quantity which um, describes the curvature of a Lorentzian manifold is the Riemannian curvature tensor. That's a tensor field of fourth rank. Yeah, I should say once and for all that I very often say tensor when I mean tensor field. Yeah, that's a very common abuse of terminology. Of course, all these tensors I'm talking about depend on the foot point. So they are tensor fields on the manifold. But we just speak of the curvature tensor, not of the curvature tensor field, and the metric tensor, and so on. So this is uh, the following thing. This has four indices. And uh, the way in which it is defined uh, is with one index, um, uh, one upper index and three lower indices. Of course, with a metric we can then push them around as we like. And this general structure is that we have two terms where you have derivatives of gammas, and then we have two terms where we have products of gammas. And the whole thing is anti-symmetric in my conventions with respect to these two indices, tau and rho. Other authors have other conventions. You have to be very careful if you compare formulas from different books on the curvature tensor. So, uh, let me see. I need an upper index mu, and the lower indices are tau, rho, sigma. And if I have the first term, then I get the second term just by anti-symmetrizing with respect to the first two lower indices. So tau and rho are to be x. Uh, no, uh, rho, tau, sigma. I should not write the indices uh, one underneath the other uh, because uh, our convention is that we raise and lower indices with a metric. And if you write it in this way, then it's clear. If you pull the index down, it occurs here. Yeah, if you write them <laughs> underneath, then it's not clear where to pull them. Yeah? And, then you, and actually, this makes a difference. Yeah? If you pull it here or pull it here, you get different expressions. So it's really a good idea to always leave this gap here so that it's clear uh, in which position the, the mu is to, to be pulled if you, if, you, uh, if you lower indices. OK, and here I write uh, the indices. I write the upper index, which is the mu here. And then I have tau rho sigma, and I need a summation index here. How should we call it? Uh, nu is free, right? Yes, nu. That's a tau. And again, I just have to interchange tau and rho. So mu, rho, nu, nu, tau, sigma. So that's a curvature tensor. You see immediately if the gammas are zero, then the curvature is zero. 
So gammas are zero, that's something which happens in special relativity, in flat space-time. So we see immediately in flat space-time the curvature tensor is zero. So this gives an idea that the name curvature tensor is maybe not too bad. It's something which vanishes in flat space. And actually the statement is much stronger than what you can read immediately from this. The condition that you find a coordinate system where the gammas vanish it is actually equivalent to vanishing of the curvature tensor. Yeah, the other direction is not trivial, not at all. So you will have to calculate for quite a while if you want to prove this, but it is true. Yeah? So if you know that the curvature tensor is zero, then you can find a coordinate system where the gammas are zero. Uh, yeah, on, uh, on uh, contractible uh, um, neighborhoods in the manifold, but that's a, that's a subtlety. So, uh, yeah, roughly speaking, the curvature tensor measures the deviation from flat space. Yeah. And uh, from the curvature tensor, we can uh, form the Ricci tensor. Which is, yeah, again, we have to be careful when we compare <laughs> different books. My convention is that I contract over the first index. So I write, this is now rho sigma, r, tau, tau, rho sigma. So the Ricci tensor is a second rank tensor. And then we also have the Ricci scalar. This is just r without indices. This is r mu nu, one index raised, and then the trace taken, right? So according to our conventions, we could also write this as r mu mu. In this case, it wouldn't be dangerous to write the indices one, uh, one below the other, because this thing is symmetric, yeah? The Ricci tensor is, uh, in the Lorentzian manifold, in the pseudo Riemannian manifold, the Ricci tensor is symmetric. For more general connections, it is not. This was in parentheses. But for, for our theory, what we are doing here, that's in particular a theory without torsion. In such, in such theories, the Ricci tensor is symmetric. So we can interchange the indices. So uh, I've already said that the Riemannian curvature tensor measures the deviation from flat space. And this manifests itself in a famous equation, which is also very important for the interpretation, that's the geodesic deviation equation. We can consider two geodesics which start parallel to each other. And we can observe if they come towards each other or move away from each other, or if they stay parallel. In flat space, of course, they would stay parallel, yeah? And they would just move in this way. And the curvature tensor tells how they move relative to each other. And the equation which describes this is a geodesic equation, a geodesic deviation equation. So it's also called the Jacobi equation, the geodesic deviation equation. Actually, Jacobi uh, didn't know it in this generality as we use it nowadays. Jacobi was a man of the early 19th century, so he considered it just on surfaces, on two-dimensional manifolds. <coughs> so it was much more special than what we, <coughs> what we are doing now. So what is this? I first draw a picture. So we consider geodesics, a congruence of geodesic which fills our space-time. So at each point we have a vector field, uh, we have a vector, say x, and the integral curves of x are geodesics. And then, so x, so that's something like that, yeah, it's a vector field, and it's geodesic, so it satisfies this equation. Here it's written down in coordinates what this means. So, and then we consider a second vector field, denoted J, which is yeah, what one calls a connecting vector field. So this is done, this is constructed in a way that the flow of this vector field J, J also has integral curves, yeah? so it has a flow, the totality of the integral curves is called the flow, so that this flow maps integral curves of X onto each other. So if I follow a flow line of J, the parameter, uh, parameter uh, interval, uh, say, from 0 to 1, and I do this for all these points, then I end on a neighboring integral curve. And the way in which this is mathematically phrased 
is that you consider the commutator. These are operators, right? Vector fields are differential operators. They act on scalar fields. And for operators, we know what the commutator is. Yeah? We can apply them in, uh, in different orders and then take the difference. And as everybody knows from quantum mechanics, the commutator is usually denoted by a bracket. In this context, for vector fields, this bracket is also called the Lie bracket. Yeah, the Lie bracket is just another word for the commutator. And the claim is, if this is zero, then the flow lines of J have the properties which I've just mentioned. So J, yeah, the, the tip of this arrow, so to speak, um, uh, always moves with a neighboring integral curve. Yeah? So the vector field J becomes shorter and longer in such a way that the tip of this arrow always moves on a neighboring integral curve. And uh, now, uh, you see that the question I've asked, namely if neighboring integral curves move towards each other or away from each other, that this is coded in the derivative of the J. Yeah, so we have to look how does J change if I follow my uh, one integral curve of the X. And this is expressed by the geodesic deviation equation. So if this is true, then we have the following equation. I have my J say, uh, I take the muth component of this, I apply the covariant derivative in respect, with respect to x once. Let me put brackets just for uh, clarity. The brackets are not necessary, actually. And uh, then I do it a second time. I consider the second derivative, x rho covariant derivative. Covariant derivative, this thing. So this tells me how the vector field j changes along my, uh, when, I, when I move in the direction of x, when I move along the integral curves. And the statement is that this is given by the curvature tensor. So here we have a curvature expression mu, tau, lambda, uh, nu. And now I have to be careful again. The j should be contracted with this index. So I have x tau, j lambda, x nu. So you see, in particular, if the curvature tensor is zero, then this second derivative is zero. And this means the neighboring curve stays parallel. Yeah? So the curvature tensor characterizes uh, the motion of uh, neighboring geodesics. This equation holds for time-like, space-like, or light-like geodesics. Yeah, the causal character is irrelevant. But it's particularly interesting in view of interpretation for time-like geodesics, because then it's for freely falling particles. And what does it mean? If we have freely falling particles, which move in a gravitational field, and which move towards each other, this means that the gravitational field produces a tidal force in this cloud of particles. Yeah, that's what we call a tidal force. The relative acceleration of neighboring particles produced by the gravitational field. So this expression is a tidal force. And that's the most important interpretation of the curvature tensor. The curvature tensor gives the tidal force. And the Ricci tensor gives something like an average tidal force, averaged over all directions in a certain way. Yeah? So uh, okay. when I give a GR course, I prove this equation. Here I think I, uh, I should not uh, waste time on doing this. Uh, you can find it in any textbook on differential geometry. So this was a curvature. Yeah, now we have all the things together, which are determined by the metric. And uh, yeah, this is what we need in order to study the motion of particles in a given gravitational field. But of course, we also want to know how the gravitational field is produced, how it is coupled to the sources. And that's coded in Einstein's field equation. So that's the uh, last and most important uh, Building, building stone of the theory we need. So this was, so to speak, kinematics. Yeah? Studying motion of particles in a give, given field. That's what one called, uh, could, well, yeah, it's partly also dynamics. Yeah? The geodesic equation is a dynamical equation, but, um, but it's dynamics of particles. That's the point. Dynamics of particles, of objects in a given gravitational field. And now, I will talk about the dynamics of the gravitational field itself. The differential equation which determines the gravitational field. So that would be the analog of the, uh, of the Poisson equation in Newton's gravitational theory, right? 
So this would be the, uh, the analog, the geodesic equation would be the analog of the equation of motion in Newton's theory. Yeah? Newton's second law written for a particle in a gravitational field. And now we talk about the analog of the Poisson equation, the equation which couples the gravitational field to its sources, and that's Einstein's field equation. Oops. Let me remind you again that the equation we are celebrating in this year, which is now just 100 years or almost, we have still a few months to wait. <laughs> it was in November that Einstein submitted the paper. That's Einstein's field equation. I prefer the singular. Yeah, you often read Einstein's field equations with an S. These are the people who think in coordinates. Yeah, you write, you read uh, the, the equation component by component, and then of course it's many equations, it's ten equations, yeah? But for me it's just one tensor equation, so it's just one equation. Anyway, that's how it looks like. So all these expressions I've already explained, that's the Ricci tensor, that's the Ricci scalar, and that's our metric. And now comes a constant lambda times g mu nu, and on the right hand side I have a constant kappa and something which is denoted t mu nu, where lambda and kappa are constants of nature. Lambda is a so-called cosmological constant. You can see it must have the same dimension as a curvature tensor, right? Here you see it from this term. Yeah? So lambda times g must have the same dimension as r times g. So lambda must have the same dimension as r. What's the dimension of a curvature? Physical dimension? Yes, 1 over length squared. Yeah? So its curvature is, uh, you can do it in, in terms of a curvature radius, which you have to do in different directions, and uh, this uh, occurs twice in the, in the denominator. So also lambda must have the dimension of 1 over length squared, and nowadays it is, but you need this, this constant, well, um, it has a long history actually. In the beginning Einstein didn't have it, he had the equation in this way. Then he found that he couldn't find static uh, cosmological solutions. And at that time, he was convinced that our universe should be, should be time independent. He didn't know about expansion of the universe, which came up uh, several decades later, two decades later. No, one de a little bit more than one decade later. <laughs> and um, uh, so he modified the equation in order to get stationary cosmological solutions. And that's why he introduced this cosmological constant. Then he was able to construct stationary cosmological solutions, but later expansion of the universe uh, became uh, yeah, uh, the, the favorized uh, idea. And also Einstein was convinced that actually our universe is expanding and it is 
he is quoted with a remark that uh, introducing Lambda was the greatest blunder in his life. If he has ever said this, I'm sure it was just a momentary, out of a momentary mood or so. I don't believe that he really thought this for a, uh, for a longer period. And actually nowadays we are conv fairly convinced that the cosmological constant is not zero, that we do need it. We do need it in order to explain all the cosmological observations, but the lambda uh, should be very, very small in conventional units. So uh, if we express this um, in one over meter squared, which is a, a conventional unit for uh, a quantity with the dimension one over length squared, then this is something like 10 to the minus 52 uh, meter, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, one over meter squared. So the length scale which is involved in this quantity is, this is a square, so I should take the square root of this, is something like 10 to the 26. Yeah? 10 to the 26 meter is a length scale which is associated with a cosmological constant. And that's a fairly big length, even by uh, cosmological standards, by astrophysical standards. Yeah? So in the solar system or within our galaxy, we can, uh, we can forget about ratios of length in this, in, this, um, in this domain in comparison to, uh, to this length of 10 to the 26 meters. And that's the reason why the lambda is believed uh, not to play a, a role for local considerations within our galaxy or even in galaxy clusters. So it becomes relevant only on cosmological scales. And kappa is a so-called gravitational constant. Einstein's gravitational constant, uh, Einstein's. And if you compare this theory with the Newtonian theory, yeah, it should give you back the Newtonian theory in a certain reasonable limit. And this, uh, this Newtonian limit allows you to compare this kappa with uh, Newton's gravitational constant. And what you find out is that this must be 8 pi g over c to the 4. G is Newton's gravitational constant. So these are the two constants of nature which occur on the right hand side and T mu nu is the energy momentum tensor or as they often say in English stress energy momentum tensor or just stress energy tensor. You also uh, find this I usually say energy momentum tensor. In German, we, I think that it's, it's very common to call it the energy impulse tensor and nothing else. Uh, okay, that's the energy momentum tensor. And again, it's a tensor field, of course. So this characterizes your particular matter model. So what this equation tells you is, on the right-hand side, you have the matter, the matter content, and matter in the most general sense of the word, including everything which has energy. Yeah? Everything which has energy is matter in this sense. Not the gravitational field. The gravitational field is not matter. This is geometrized, but everything else is matter. Yeah? And this is on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we have the space-time geometry. And that's where the gravitational field is encoded into. So matter tells space-time how to curve. This is how John Wheeler used to interpret this equation. Yeah? If you give me the matter, then you have this equation to solve. Well, what, what sort of equation is this? In the curvature quantities, you have second derivatives of the metric. Yeah? You have first derivatives of the gamma, and the gammas contain first derivatives of the metric. So altogether, you have second derivatives of the metric here and here. So it's a second order partial differential equation. In this case, really partial differential equation for the metric. And uh, yeah, if you specify the matter model, if you specify the right hand side, then you have to solve this equation. And uh, an important remark, which I always make, if uh, that Einstein's field equation are absolutely meaningless as long as you do not specify the energy momentum tensor. Yeah? If somebody tells you, I found a new solution to Einstein's field equation, that's a completely meaningless statement. Yeah? As long as he doesn't tell you what the energy momentum tensor is, this is completely meaningless. So every metric is a solution to Einstein's field equation in this general sense. Give me any metric, I calculate the left-hand side. 
And then I say, this is my energy momentum tensor, and I found a solution to Einstein's field equation. Yeah? But that's not what is meant. What is meant when people say we are working on finding new solutions to Einstein's field equation, they mean they specify the energy momentum tensor, and then they really solve this differential equation for G. Specifying the energy momentum tensor usually means writing an expression for this here, not something very concrete with numbers in it or something like that, just an expression which usually also considers the metric, also involves the metric. So the metric is usually not only on the left hand side but also on the right hand side. And I will do three examples for energy momentum tensors now. I think these will be the only ones which will be address in this course. So you can solve this for any kind of, or try to solve it, for any kind of energy momentum tensor. Yeah? Whatever comes to your head, into your head, uh, what kind of meta model you want to consider, you can discuss this equation. But the things which are relevant for our topic for black hole, uh, for black holes, I think I would say are only, are mainly, mainly three things. So the first, of course, is vacuum. This is T mu nu equals zero. Then, of course, it does not contain the metric. That's why I said, in general, it also contains the metric. And then the field equation simplifies to R mu nu is um, lambda G mu nu. Yeah, with a little bit of, um, of uh, arithmetic, you can, if you set this equal to zero, then you take the trace, so you subtract the trace from the whole equation, and then you find this. So then the field equation looks this way. Uh, this is the vacuum field equation with a cosmological constant and Lorentzian manifolds which satisfy this equation, they are called Einstein manifolds in the mathematical literature. So that's vacuum and I think everybody knows one solution, to the, one non-trivial solution to the vacuum equation, that's the Schwarzschild solution and we will refresh our memory on this next time. Then we have um, a perfect fluid. That would be something which is a good model for the interior of a star, for instance, or also for, um, for the Hubble flow, yeah, for, our, for our universe as a whole. Then the T mu nu is, I never, I never know where the C squared is. Oops, I have to look it up. Hope I find it. Yeah, here it is. So that's the mass density plus P over C squared, is that right? Yes. U mu, u nu, that's the four velocity of the fluid, and now comes the metric. So as I said, usually the energy momentum tensor also involves the metric. So P is the pressure, mu is the mass density, u mu is the four velocity of the, of the fluid. So that's what you have to write on the right hand side if you want to discuss, for instance, the interior of stars and you will discuss. Is there a question? You just said there's a, this is a plus that's what you mean. This is supposed to be plus sign, yes. Oops. I'm writing with my fingers <laughs> almost because uh, we are a little bit short with chalk. Okay, then we have an electromagnetic field. We will also, as I said, I will also address charged black holes, at least briefly. And for that, of course, I will need the energy momentum tensor for an electromagnetic field. This is uh, in these funny units which we nowadays have to use as this stupid um, permeability of the vacuum, mu naught, yeah? <laughs> but we have to use it. <laughs> and then we have F is the field tensor, so the electromagnetic field is described in terms of this thing. Uh, where are the indices? Have to be careful about the sign, right? Here's a mu, this is the first index. Yes. Yeah, if I do it in the other order, I get a sign mistake. And uh, minus one quarter g mu nu. And here you cannot make a mistake uh, because, and I should, shouldn't use mu and nu. Rho sigma, rho sigma, okay. So that's it. So F is the electromagnetic field. It comprises the E field and the B field in a four by four matrix, anti-symmetric four by four matrix. And if you put this expression on the right hand side of your field equation, then you can uh, discuss the electrovacuum field equation. Yeah, the field equation where the source of the gravitational field is an electromagnetic field. 
So they have a charge object, for instance, and we will also discuss this. Okay, I just managed to get through the review of GR, and then next time we do Quartzschild. So see you on Friday.